from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. I'm Tyne Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. Planting is just getting started in some areas, but it's already a story of the East versus the West. So we've effectively sharpened up that gradient, and we'll see those delays in the Eastern Corn Belt starting to multiply. But as El Nino fades, we'll tell you what La Nina could bring. USDA's latest look at supply and demand stirred up some debate. To me, the, the biggest surprise were, um, you know, call it the lack of changes that we saw uh, from the USDA. As NASA announces, it's discontinuing a couple big reports. And the end of an era in Texas as the sugarcane industry continues to wither away. U.S. Farm Report, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the name on a cap matches the power of one's purpose. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Now for the news, USDA releasing a new batch of numbers this week with the latest supply and demand report with a focus on ending stocks and exports. Taking a look at the latest ending stocks numbers in the report, all three corn, soybeans, and wheat were higher than what the trade had expected. Corn at 2.1 billion bushels, that is 50 million bushels lower than last month. The agency forecasting higher corn used for ethanol, but unchanged numbers for exports. For soybeans, ending stocks were raised 25 million bushels to 340 million, that was on lower exports. And for wheat, 698 million bushels, up 25 million from last month. Again, no change to exports. Now USDA making some small changes to South American crop production numbers, lowering corn production in Argentina due to a decline in yield expectations. No change to the country's soybean crop size, and it made no changes at all to Brazil forecast for corn and soybeans. One analyst saying USDA should have made more changes to South America. We'll talk about that coming up in our marketing roundtable. Some key numbers producers need to make decisions about their crops and livestock may soon no longer be available. The National Agricultural Statistics Service, or NAS, announcing it's canceling the July cattle report, as well as all county estimates for crops and livestock starting this year. NAS blaming budget cuts from the most recent appropriations bills. It now intends to only release one cattle inventory report annually. That happens in January. However, the news is not setting well with farm groups we talked to, including the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, who told Michelle Rook this will mean more volatility for the market and make it more difficult for producers to see into the future when it comes to supplies. There are other ways that the agency can go about trying to pinch pennies and make sure that they are making those dollars stretch as far as they possibly can. But especially since this administration has touted its transparency agenda since the very beginning of the Biden administration. USDA tried to cut the July cattle inventory report in 2016 and ended up reinstating it. NCBA is calling on NAS to reverse its decision again. Keeping you updated on the avian flu and dairy cattle outbreak, new cases were confirmed this week. The latest cases involve dairy herds in North Carolina and South Dakota. USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service website saying that it was also officially detected now in two dairy farms in New Mexico. That brings the total number of states with confirmed cases to eight. Well, besides dealing with an outbreak of avian flu in dairy cattle in Texas, Texas is continuing to recover from devastating wildfires that hit the Panhandle area in late February. Texas Ag Commissioner Sid Miller says producers are still tallying up the damage, but it's estimated the fires consumed 1.3 million acres or about 2,000 square miles in the state. He says the state lost about 10,000 head of cattle and more could die over the next six months due to respiratory issues. The fires damaged or destroyed 120 miles of electrical lines, along with 500 houses, barns, and structures. There's some really long-term effects. For instance, our, our fences, once they are, go through a fire like that, they may still be up, but the T-posts have lost all their outer coating, so they're going to eventually rust. The, the barbed wire is still up, but the tensile strength is gone. As soon as winter hits and it contracts, it'll all bust, so it's, it's all got to be replaced. A lot of it's on, on the ground. He says right now the greatest need is still for feed, hay, and fencing supplies for those ranchers. For more on how you can help, check out TexasAgriculture.gov. 
a federal program that helps pay for groceries for millions of low-income mothers, babies, and young kids will put an emphasis on eating more fruits and vegetables as well as whole grains. New rules to the WIC program were announced this week. They extend COVID-era cash vouchers for fruits and vegetables. But the rules also focus on whole grains, eliminate or reduce juice, and lower the quantities of milk. As you can imagine, the dairy industry is not happy with the decision regarding milk, saying in a combined news release that it, quote, is disturbed by the decision to reduce access to the essential nutrients dairy adds to diet, end quote. It went on to say milk, cheese, and yogurt are three of the five top redeemed items through WIC. WIC served about 6.6 .6 million people a month in 2023 at a cost of about $7 billion. A warm up to a cool down. We'll have a check of your forecast coming up next. U.S. Farm Report weather is brought to you by H&S Manufacturing. With five models ranging from 1,300 to the large 4,200 gallon and the ability to provide an excellent spread pattern, H&S has a top shot side discharge manure spreader to fit your operation. Find out more at the H&S website. Time now for a check of your forecast this weekend. Martin Lowramore joining us. Martin, I don't know what it's like for you in South Bend, but here in Kansas City, we're seeing temps touch nearly 90 degrees this weekend. How long does this warmth stick around? It's on, uh, not 90 degrees, but we could reach 80 degrees here in Indiana. So it is going to be a little bit warmer over the next couple of days. And it's not just us in South Bend and you in Kansas City. It's a lot of the nation actually seeing much warmer than average temperatures. Now this will start to fade away as we get into our next work where you see this is the 16th through 20th low pressure making its way into parts of the Pacific Northwest It's going to drop those temps across that part of the country. It's also going to trickle its way eventually into the rest of the nation as we get toward the end of our April nearing the beginning of our May, but still we're very warm and with this low pressure pushing in, it's going to cause plenty of areas across the uh, parts of the Ohio River Valley and into the Southern Plains, getting some pretty decent rainfall though missing out on the other end of that low pressure system. It's going to start getting a little drier out toward the Pacific Northwest places that don't necessarily really need much more than rainfall because honestly, a lot of us are doing pretty good when it comes to that rainfall. I'll show you the drought monitor in just a second. But when we get to your jet stream, as we're watching this ridge of high pressure staying across the area, there's this low. This low we're watching pretty closely because this could actually bring in some stronger storms across parts of Kansas, Oklahoma and Texas. We're looking at the possibility of significant severe weather in this part of the country. So if you are going to be in this part of the country around your Monday, keep a watch out. This is going to trickle into your Tuesday. Could see some more storms popping up near Illinois, possibly in Indiana, even stretching in toward parts of southern and eastern portions of Missouri. So it's going to be looking like we could see some of those stronger storms continuing their way up into the Ohio River Valley, though it should start fading away as we get into that Wednesday and Thursday time frame. Drought monitor again. Only a handful of places really struggling with that drought. Going to be looking at mainly southern New Mexico, where the only actual uh, exceptional drought is still left, and then parts of eastern Iowa sitting right now under extreme drought. Other than that, a lot of us are doing pretty good when it comes to the start of that farming season, though. Again, you could see out toward Kansas and Nebraska places sitting on that moderate and just dry area. So it is places that do need a little bit more rainfall, but with a couple of these low pressure systems, that could alleviate that pretty well as we head into the next couple of days. Estimated rainfall watching as that next low pressure moves through. Look at that much needed rain for Iowa and parts of the Central Plains. Unfortunately, not going to be seeing much in that area that desperately needs it in southern New Mexico, but overall still looking pretty good over the next several days. So we're going to be seeing plenty of rainfall across, especially at places into Iowa and Minnesota where plants have already been planted. It seems like we just had a USDA report with the big plantings report at the end of March, but USDA gave us an updated look at world supply and demand on Thursday. We'll break down the biggest changes with Arlen Suderman and Chip Nellinger next. Welcome back to US Farm Report this weekend. Chip Nellinger and Arlen Suderman joining us. All right, big USDA report this week. Before we get into changes to South America, USDA cutting 50 million bushels from the 2023-2024 corn carryover from last month. USDA raising soybean carryover 25 million bushels from last month. Arlen, are, are, were those changes justified? Well, the cut in uh, corn ending stocks was certainly justified, and they have more to go. Cheap prices do generate uh, demand, and that's happening in corn. Uh, I think the bigger cuts yet to come uh, are going to be related to 
added ethanol demand. If you look at marketing year to date, ethanol use of corn, we still exceed the seasonal pace needed to hit USDA's newly revised target by 98 million bushels. So we could see that, that uh, ethanol demand go up considerably yet, but we're still gonna be above 2 billion bushels. So I don't wanna get anyone overly bullish on that. Uh, and when you look at the soybean side, they cut exports as I think that was justified, but they continue to hold the line on crush. And I think they're gonna be forced to increase crush. And that's gonna pull us back toward that 300 million bushel ending stocks estimate. Still not bullish, but not as bearish as where they currently have us. So Chip, was the bigger surprise for you the changes and revisions that we saw to carry over here? Or was it the changes that we saw USDA make to South America this month? Yeah, to me, the, the biggest surprise were, um, you know, call it the lack of changes that we saw uh, from the USDA versus some of the numbers that are coming out of like CONAB and the Rosario Grain Exchange in, in Argentina. Um, you know, the USDA just seems like there's this massive disconnect, still about 500 million plus bushels difference with where CONAB came out uh, on, uh, on Thursday versus where the USDA came out for the Brazil bean crop. So uh, I think something's got to give there. I think the market's a little bit confused about that. And it, uh, it is going to have a direct influence, no matter what the crop size is, on our exports. So, um, you know, I think there's still some, uh, some unknowns out there as far as uh, what the ultimate crop size is in the Southern Hemisphere. Well, speaking of something's got to give, Arlen, nothing is giving when it comes to wheat. I mean, we saw USDA raise wheat carryover 25 million bushels. I mean, the hits just keep coming. Yeah, and that was largely tied to the stocks report on March 28th as the USDA carried that in, cutting feed usage, cutting imports, um, and so pushing ending stocks up there just below that 700 million bushel mark. And if we get some trend yields for the 24 crop, we're going to continue to add to those stocks and make them bigger. Uh, the U.S. is becoming the residual supplier to the world once again. The Black Sea is setting the world wheat price. And even though we've seen Russian prices start to slowly creep higher, Ukraine continues to push wheat out the door at low prices. And so that's really holding down the market. And we're getting very close to the Northern Hemisphere harvest now as well. Well, we know after the prospective plantings report, after this April report, the market's attention really focusing on weather. When you look at the latest planting progress report, we're going to talk about it later in the show too. But I mean, it is the East versus the West, Chip. Yeah, it is. And it was last year as well. You look at the drought map that came out this week, uh, still, even though there were some uh, decent rains around there uh, in the Western Corn Belt, still uh, worse setup at this point in the calendar than what we had in 2012. And I'm not saying we're going to have a repeat of 2012 growing season weather, but there needs to be some uh, regular rainfall in that Western Corn Belt during the growing season. Initially, the dry weather may be bearish for planting it may mean a quick planting pace but there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty and and time to your point there uh, i just add on about the wheat you know we're going to need some rain in the black sea area and uh in russia and we're going to need rain in the southern plains to get the wheat crop worldwide across the finish line so there's still some question there and then to your point the question about how is planting going to go and what does this la nina mean to summer temperatures and rainfall especially the western corn belt Tremendous amount of uncertainty there going forward. Yeah, and meteorologists will admit right now there's a lot of uncertainty with what La Nina could mean. All right. Well, World Weather is saying they're concerned about wheat country right now, especially with weather conditions this weekend, plus USDA doing away with a major cattle report. We told you about that earlier in the show. But could that add to the volatility in the cattle market? We're going to talk about that right after the break. All right, before we get into talking livestock, Arlen World Weather are saying west central portions of the U.S. hardwood or wet, red, hard red wheat country are too dry and crop stress is expected to worsen as the hot and dry weather evolves this weekend. Definitely an area that we're watching. Yeah, really are watching it as, as uh, we continue to see the shadow behind the Rocky Mountains continue to keep moisture really wanting in the High Plains region. So far, the wheat crop looks pretty good. We really can't complain too much, but how long can that last? The moisture requirements of the crop continue to ramp up as the crop grows in size and we get later in the year going into the reproductive phase. So it's going to be very critical here over these next few weeks. 
uh, and a lot of hot winds really pulling the moisture as well. We're really hoping that we get it. We're in a situation, if we get the timely rains, we can have a great crop. If we don't get those timely rains, then we can really disappoint. And uh, so these next coming weeks are going to be critical for it. Well, areas around Lubbock and Amarillo, Chip, they got some rain. Good news uh, for cotton country. Also good news for some of these pastures. And as you look at NASA's decision to do away with that July cattle inventory, inventory report, it just seems like really poor timing when we have such tight cattle supplies and we're not going to have that mid-year check-in, Chip. Yeah, it's going to be uh, something that the, the livestock market and the grain markets uh, are going to have to, uh, you know, kind of get used to. I mean, uh, it, it has obvious impl implications as far as what the herd size and the different classes and, and weights, um, you know, across, the, you know, our cattle herd are. Uh, so that's going to be a big unknown in the middle of the year. And, you know, not only that, but you've got the grain implications on. Um, you know, what's that mean to feed demand? How many you know, head of cattle are on feed? But also they're going to do away with the uh, county by county uh, yield reporting. So that has uh, some wild implications on the grain markets as well. So a little bit of, of a rug pull there from the USDA here uh, earlier this uh, past week. Now, Arlen, when you look at the volatility in the cattle markets that we're already seeing, do you think doing away with this report helps that volatility or just causes it to be even more extreme? It adds to the volatility, very definitely does so. And I think you mentioned the timeliness of it. The frustration in the industry is when they look at some of the things that USDA is spending money on that don't seem to be part of the original mission of the agency and then shorten change us on issues that really have an economic impact on the development and progress of the economy and the, of this industry. That's where the frustration is. And we're certainly hearing it from customers a loud voice coming from our customers. We just don't know if USDA is hearing that. Yeah, USDA pretty much saying this is a, this is a done deal, uh, but we'll see what happens. All right, switching over to hog prices. I mean, when you look at the pork complex, we're seeing some momentum kind of shift over there, a change in prices. Well, you know, what's driving that chip? Uh, I think a couple of things. You know, I, I think number one, um, you know, we, we really saw some better demand and have seen better demand. You know, the exports have been really strong. I think we're seeing some tailwind from the questions about avian flu. Um, you know, not that it's perfectly rhymes with the mad cow situation, but I, I think the industry's maybe taking it initially like that, right? Like there's questions about maybe the, the beef and exports and are people going to, you know, not import our beef and pork is kind of gaining some influence there. Our exports have been excellent the last few weeks. Uh, and, and I think overall, we maybe went a little too far to the downside. I think the recent inflation numbers maybe got the funds involved back on the long side. So it's been a kind of a perfect storm to get us a, a nice rally here over the last few weeks. Arlen, do you think it is more demand or with the latest hogs and pigs report, you know, did anything there kind of shift the situation on the supply side? Yeah, it's really been the demand has been outperforming over the last six months. And so I, that's really the strength of it. Some of it, I think, is with high beef prices, how we're moving demand down the, the value chain. Um, some of it is some of the other factors that Chip mentioned as well. All of it coming together when you look at carcass weights. Um, and how current we've been staying with this market. Uh, this is a much healthier picture than what we anticipated or the industry anticipated being in a few months back and uh, something that producers can uh, be grateful for. Exactly. All right, Arlen Chip, thank you so much. All right, we need to take a quick break and then we're checking in with Machine Repeat for Tractor Tales next. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Germinator Steel Closing Wheels. Perfected in conventional, excels in no-till. Order your Germinator closing wheels today. Hey folks, welcome back to Tractor Tales. We're off to North Dakota this week to check out a very special John Deere collection. It's been 50 years that I started collecting. I bought the first tractor, a Model D, in 1973. I bought that D because uh, my father farmed was one for when I was growing up, and I spent a lot of time out on the tractor with him when he was working in the field. I know you aren't supposed to ride on the tractor with anyone else, but in those days, that was he was the babysitter. I caught the bug about collecting when I got that D. 
And then I saw another model and I thought, gee, I'd like to have that too. And then I'd see another one and I, I kind of like that one too. Every model has uh, something a little bit unique about it. And you know, I guess that's why they made different models is because there was different features for different needs. I think if I see something that I really think I would want, I, I would still try to get it. Drought has nearly disappeared in some areas, but it's becoming more potent for others. And as planting gears up, when could the transition from El Nino to La Nina occur? That's our Farm Journal report after the break. You're watching U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. According to the second crop progress report of the year by USDA, there are seven states who have started planting as of last Sunday. Those are in green on the screen, as you can see, and six of those states are ahead of the five-year average already. But planting progress is already a story of the East versus the West, and farmers may have a new storm to weather the spring as we say goodbye to El Nino and hello to La Nina this year. The drought picture has drastically changed over the past six months. And while planting progress numbers for corn are just starting to roll in, USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says there's another crop to watch that may be a better indicator of planting progress this spring. I think oat planting is actually a pretty good surrogate for how field work is actually going in the Midwest this time of year. Rippey says this map tells the story the best. And you'll notice kind of an interesting trend showing up on the oat planting chart. And that is how fast everything is going in the western part of the Corn Belt. USDA's crop progress report this week showing oat planting in Iowa is 20 points ahead of normal. South Dakota is 12 points quicker than the average pace. If you look at the numbers for Iowa and Nebraska, you see almost a third of the intended oat acreage planted by April 7th. That's way ahead of normal. We see planting already taking place into South Dakota, Minnesota, and even Wisconsin. And those numbers are pretty unusual for this time of year. So that indicates that dryness, that underlying dryness that still exists in parts of the upper Midwest, the Western Corn Belt region, and of course, extending back to the Great Plains. But in the East, states like Pennsylvania are eight points behind in planting, and the Eastern half of the country received more rain this week. So we've effectively sharpened up that gradient, and we'll see those delays in the Eastern Corn Belt starting to multiply. But for the most part, it's going to be planters rolling in the upper Midwest and the Great Plains as we have seen a deficit of, of rainfall for the last several weeks. Rippey says another map that shows the story is topsoil moisture. The topsoil moisture in New Mexico is considered nearly 80 percent short to very short. Kansas is closing in on 60 percent. But if you look at areas considered to be in surplus, all of the northeast and parts of the eastern Corn Belt are seeing too much moisture today. The big storm about a week ago, bringing that big, big stripe of moisture across the Midwest. And that pushed topsoil moisture numbers to 68% surplus in Ohio, 35% in Indiana. For areas seeing drier conditions, it's aiding an impressive planting pace. That's great for keeping the planting going, but we do need moisture for winter wheat and soon for those recently planted summer crops. But that also comes with deep concerns about just how dry it is. There's people out there that are saying, man, we've not recovered what we've lost incrementally over the last four years. And so until we start to see some major moisture recovery deep down on our soil, we're going to have that concern. Nutrient Ag Solutions Senior Science Fellow Eric Snodgrass says there's no doubt El Nino has helped soften the drought. At fall, we had 40 percent of the lower 48 in some form of drought. Uh, now it's down about 18 percent. Meteorologists say El Nino peaked in December, but the ripple effects are still being felt now. Even though we've long since passed the peak of El Nino, we still see a weather pattern that is very consistent with what you would expect to see during El Nino. So we're kind of seeing the, the death throes of this El Nino, a lot of southern track storms coming in through California. The rains that fell in Texas and Oklahoma this week also stem from El Nino, and Rippy is watching more rain in the forecast next week. Next week's storm looks like it will actually track more into the upper Midwest. 
that could be some really good news for some of those drier areas in the Western Corn Belt, even the Great Plains, as we look at a, a Northwestern shifting storm track over the next week or two. And that uh, really could help to alleviate some of those concerns in the Western Corn Belt. But more than rain, Snodgrass is keeping an eye on a shot of cold air that could blast the U.S. yet this month. I do have a word of caution, and that is there is some evidence that starting around the 17th and 18th, a big system that will be going through the central plains, very windy system on the 17th, 16th, 17th, and 18th, that system may get cut off and sit and spin over the Great Lakes around the 19th, 20th, and 21st. He says when a cutoff gets stuck, it draws much colder air, and that could hit the northern Corn Belt late next week. And there is just some evidence that much of the northern Corn Belt, maybe you can get as far south as maybe 40 degrees north latitude, straight across the country, we should be able to get a frost temperature in which would be a little bit later than average for parts of the ice states. Snodgrass says after that, he does expect more normal spring weather. There will be storm systems, but we need them. We, we got to get the moisture in. And when the windows open, we're going to get a crop planted, I think, pretty rapidly throughout the Midwest. Entering into spring as El Nino fades, La Nina is knocking at the door. I feel like the transition to La Nina is already underway. The thing about that is that the impacts often are not felt for many months. Rippy says just like the impacts of El Nina are still being felt four months after its peak, the claws of La Nina may not come until fall. Even if we make that transition into La Nina by, say, summertime, we're likely not to feel the impacts of La Nina until we get into the autumn of 2024. So that's good news for the growing season. Snodgrass says the transition to La Nina is so hard to predict because of something atmospheric scientists call the spring forecast barrier. And what we found is that our ability to predict well how El Nino is going to transition before you get through the month of May is pretty bad. Once we get into May and start to pay attention to those ocean temperature changes, we'll be much better at predicting it. And a lot rides on it. Snodgrass says he may not be confident in projecting La Nina and the impacts right now. But one thing he is confident about is temperatures this summer. He's expecting warmer than average temperatures during the summer months, most of that coming in the form of warmer overnight lows. He says much of that is driven by the collapse of El Nino to more neutral conditions for now than leading into La Nina. While Brazil's booming cropland could expand 45% or 70 million acres in the years ahead, We'll tell you more coming up in a glimpse around the world next. Brazil's booming cropland could expand 45% or 70 million acres in the years ahead. That's according to analysis from FarmDoc. The FarmDoc report is called Potential for Crop Expansion in Brazil based on pasture land and double cropping. Analysts say the growth could be facilitated by converting overgrazed and overgrown pasture land, especially in key agricultural states like Mato Grosso. They also suggested that by intensifying land use for the safrina crop, which is the second corn crop, that could also expand acreage. Currently, safrina corn, which is planted after soybeans, occupies about 40% of the land used for growing soybeans. They say the biggest challenge will be fuel and fertilizer costs, as well as an overburdened transportation system. Fresh water is the heartbeat of life, from agriculture to people. One group says there are around 2.2 billion people who don't have access to clean drinking water. That includes more than a third of Africa that's now considered water insecure. Bill Weir spoke with students at MIT who see a potential solution in our oceans. On a planet of nearly 8 billion people, as aquifers are drained, reservoirs evaporate and sea levels rise, Earth's freshwater supply is getting dirtier, saltier, and scarcer. And while desalination keeps some wealthy nations alive, making salt water sweet demands the kind of energy and infrastructure that's just out of reach for the most desperate societies. I really had a chance to teach in a rural area in China. Um, I was really shocked to see that how struggling they were to get some clean water. It's no wonder that some of the most promising breakthroughs in water tech are coming from the melting pot laboratories of Boston, where MIT's Yang Zong and Linang Zhang invented a machine the size of a suitcase that mimics the circulation power of the ocean. Powered only by sunlight, they say their prototype can desalinate six liters an hour 
at a cost cheaper than tap water. So for a device that has the footprint of a solar panel, this will cost around like $150 to $200. That's it for a glimpse around the globe. All right, NASA's decision to cancel a couple reports stirred up quite the debate this week. Chip Flory talked to the head of the crops branch from NAS. We'll have part of that conversation next. Chip's Corner on U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Grounded. Spray smarter and improve herbicide performance with Grounded, a multifunctional adjuvant from Helena. Chip Lori joining us now for Chip's Corner. Chip, typically in a USDA report week, that's the big news out of USDA, trying to digest the report, what it all means. But also this week, we heard that NAS is discontinuing a couple of reports. And Chip, we're not talking about small reports here. No. No, we certainly are not. Let's start with a really big one. And that's the cattle inventory report that was coming our way in July. Now, we talked with Lance Honig from NAS earlier this week on AgriTalk. And it, it's it's about timing as much as it is funding time because it took so long to get the baseline funding for USDA in place to begin with. A lot of the work that they would have done for that July cattle inventory report, it wasn't being done to, to begin with because they didn't have any funding. And now that they, it kind of forced their hand to make that final decision. But there are some of the other reports out there. And one in particular that really got the grain market's attention is no more county yields for crops. And that's going to have a big impact on how a lot of people make adjustments for, for some of the safety net programs that are out there. A few years ago, from a crop insurance standpoint, uh, our good friends and partners over at RMA have been utilizing a lot more of their own internal data uh, to support those programs. And then, of course, we've always you know, thought about the ARC PLC programs and our, our close friends over at FSA have also been tapping into a lot more of that RMA-driven data and a lot less of the NAS data. And so we've worked closely with them to ensure uh, that the impact won't be as extensive as a lot of folks might think from the outside looking okay. in. Okay, Tyne, the county by county crop estimates, yield estimates, uh, have been a point of discussion for a long time on whether or not they that was something that NAS was going to continue. You heard Lance right there talk about the RMA and the FSA, how they both got county by county production numbers it was, it, it's almost a duplication of effort that they are trying to cut out of the the costs of doing these surveys at, at NAS. And as a result, we end up with, with some data that, that a lot of people in the industry have grown accustomed, accustomed to using over the years. It, you talk to the elevator guys, they look at that NAS county by county data as they're trying to make their plans for the year ahead on exactly where they're going to be drawing stocks from for the year. So it, it's going to be, it, it's, it's going to change the way that the industry does some business. And Lance acknowledged that. I know when you talk yeah. to him on AgriTalk, he acknowledged, acknowledged that for the industry folks, this would be a challenge. Okay. So that, that kind of makes sense, but it seems like discontinuing this cattle report is very short sighted. I mean, I understand it's this year budget this year, but it's going to go away for good. Right. Yeah, like Lance said, when they made this announcement, there was not a question mark on it. They made the announcement that this that the July cattle inventory report is going away. Um, it it is a piece of data, and as you made reference to, that uh, we're going to be missing at a very critical time in this cattle industry in the cycle. We're trying to figure out exactly just how small the beef breeding herd might get. <laughs> And right. we're trying to figure out exactly when the rebuilding is going to start. Exactly. We have such tight supplies, cattle prices where they are. This just seems like really bad timing. It is. And NCBA has made note of that and said, listen, they called it an arbitrary decision. It's not arbitrary. Uh, it, it, this, this is a report that has been under the microscope for a budget cut for a long time. All right. Well, Chip, the explanation and you talking to Lance, it definitely gave some great perspective. Yeah. So thank you for that. All right. Chip Flory, host of AgriTalk. You can catch him 10 a.m. weekdays for AgriTalk a.m., 2 p.m. Central weekdays for AgriTalk p.m. All right. We need to take a quick break. And then it's an end of an era. 
for one industry in Texas. We'll tell you what that is next. It's the end of an agricultural era. Texas sugarcane is no more. For over 50 years, the sweet crop has been grown in the Rio Grande Valley. But due to water shortages, the state's one and only sugar mill has closed its doors. The closure due in part to a dispute between Mexico and the U.S. over access to irrigation water. The Texas Farm Bureau spoke to some of those impacted by the decision. It's really strange to prepare a crop plan for the year of 2024 and to not have sugar cane involved in that crop plan. It's, it's gonna take a while to really uh, settle in. My name is Sam Sparks, owner and operator at SRS Farms here in Mercedes, Texas, right next to Santa Rosa. We grow cotton, corn, grain sorghum, soybeans, sesame, and used to be sugar cane. My family's actually been involved in the sugar mill since inception. My grandfather was one of the first growers. I guess that was back in 71, 72. He grew cane. My father grew cane. I grew cane. It's the only sugar producing region in the state of Texas. We have the ability to grow sugar productively. Our biggest issue is it requires irrigation water. We have a treaty uh, that was formed in 1944 with Mexico to where they get a portion of the water that comes down the Rio Grande River along with the United States. Over the years, they've built up multiple dams and have been uh, collecting water and not giving the United States the water that uh, is in the treaty. With a shortage of irrigation water, that's, that's where we're at today and why they've decided that we're going to have to cease operations at the mill. The mill has about uh, 90 growers. It's a co-op, and I'm one of the growers. I'm Tudor Yulehorn. I'm chairman of the board of Rio Grande Valley Sugar Growers. We have been the only sugarcane mill since 1974. This was our 51st season that we just completed, which was will be our last. Normally, this warehouse would still be full of sugar, but as you can see, it's completely empty and we've shipped all the sugar. It's really, really sad. Um, you know, I've thought about it a lot. And, um, you know, initially you think about all the employees that have worked up there for a long period of time, uh, their families being affected, and then to think of, you know, all the countless blood, sweat, and tears that have gone into evolving the sugar mill into what it is today. And now here we are, they've all come to nothing. The guys who were around at day one, when they first started talking about building this mill here, my goodness, really hard for them to understand why the United States won't do something as far as not only Mexico holding the water that they owe the United States, but also stealing water. There's a lot of water theft out of the Rio Grande River that the United States is not doing anything about. We're being good stewards of the water that's coming down the Rio Grande River. Why don't they enforce Mexico to do the same? I would say sugar grain is the very first of many. The citrus industry would be next. And then all of our vegetables that we grow. We grow lots of different varieties of vegetables and greens uh, that require irrigation water on a regular basis. And if we don't have the irrigation water to supply those crops, we just can't grow them. And so it, it's desperate times right now in the Rio Grande Valley. Thanks again to Texas Farm Bureau. And according to the Sugar Association, sugar cane is grown in two other states. The yellow on this map shows those areas where sugar cane is grown, which includes portions of Louisiana and Florida. And as you can see by this map, sugar is also produced in a variety of other ways in the U.S. The red is where sugar beet factories are located. When we come back, this one mistake at planting could be costing you more than 100 bushels per acre in yield for corn. That's next. Planters are just starting to roll, but what's the key to growing big yields? According to the reigning National Corn Yield Contest champ, David Hula, you can't have 300 bushel per acre yields if you don't start with a 300 bushel per acre stand. And there's one mistake that could be costing you 
more than 100 bushels per acre for corn. Now, Hula is known for his big yields. He won the National Corn Yield Contest last year with a whopping 623.8 bushels per acre yield. You heard that right, over 600 bushels per acre. We asked him, what's the secret to such big yields? He says, really, there's no magic bullet, but based on one of his trials last year, it can be something as simple as making sure your planter is set perfectly. That includes the closing wheel system being centered. One row tie actually was as low as 198 bushels. That's not bad, but on a 24 row planter, one row was 302. So we had a 104 bushel difference between that. And you know, did one row get better weather? Absolutely not. The planter was not performing like it should. I was with Randy Dowdy and as fast as he could walk from one row to the next, he figured out the problem. It was a closing wheel system, wasn't centered. So growers got to stop, check things out, but they got to start knowing that it's set. Hula says many times farmers want to blame the weather. However, he's found sometimes it just falls back to small mistakes that can cause big losses in yield. All right, next weekend, we're going to hear from Ken Ferry and Missy Bauer. I call them our resident crop whisperers. They'll talk about what crucial mistakes they see at planting and how you can avoid those this year. So tune in for that. All right, that's all the time we have this weekend. Make sure to join us next weekend as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.